Township Baptist Church. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing hymn number 88, Jesus Saves. Jesus Saves. We're going to do all four verses of hymn number 88, Jesus Saves, on that first. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the waves. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. On the second. Wafted on the rolling tide, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, tell to sinners far and wide, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing the islands of the sea, echo back ye ocean caves, earth shall keep her jubilee, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, on the third. Sing above the battle strife. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Thy is death and endless life. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing it softly through the gloom. When the heart for mercy craves, sing it triumph for the tomb. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. On the last. Give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves. This is our song of victory. Jesus saves. Announcements and birthdays. Yep, they can be seated. And you can be seated. Right? All right. Vernon's shorthanded this morning. Uh, we've got junior week coming up uh, in a couple weeks. Nathan is running all of that. Um, I got some text messages yesterday, and I think Nathan got it all lined out. Uh, teen week, the cutoff for signing up for teen week for the pre registration is uh, Memorial Weekend. Uh, just talk to me about getting, uh, I've got forms in the back for your teenagers for you all to fill out. Get those to me, and we'll get that all done and the pre-registration done um, for Teen Week. And then this Saturday, right, Strawberry Festival? Yeah, sure. Jeez. This Saturday, Strawberry Festival, um, there are a couple open slots still for help with the horses. We will, we will need your help, and then I, I would love for Car Township just to make a good showing there. Um, at the Borden Park for Strawberry Festival. Uh, I'm praying and hoping that's going to be a huge outreach uh, for us and for our Vacation Bible School uh, to try to promote uh, the horse rides and those things for our Vacation Bible School. We will have Nathan's worked up invitations that have already got our Vacation Bible School on it and ready to go to try and promote that at the Strawberry Festival. That's Saturday. Then Monday, oh, Saturday, we'll be there from 12 to 6 also. If you're going to be there to help, you're going to have to leave early. I know last year was uh, a big ordeal with traffic. They've worked some stuff out this year to make it better, but be prepared for traffic trying to get there if you're coming to help. Um, Monday is our uh, Memorial Day softball cookout. We will have grills there. Normally, the kind of the routine, it's from 2 to 8. We come in, everybody kind of gets set up. We'll play a first game of softball, and then we'll cook uh, our dinner then. We'll have guys there with grills. They'll be grilling up all the food. If you've got food, just bring it. You'll bring it to the guys with the grill. They'll grill it up for you, have it ready to go. We'll have canopies set up. Bring your own chairs. Uh, there'll be bathrooms there. Uh, there is a building with AC in it as well in case it's hot. Um, and then there's we'll have bounce house for the kids. And it's just, it's a good time. I enjoy it every year. It's kind of a right before summer starts and we get crazy busy and everybody's running around doing everything. It's a good event for the church group to get together and have fellowship and have a lot of fun. Right before everybody gets crazy running around and doing everything? Well, I mean, oh, right. yeah. <laughs> I feel like it's always going on. Honestly. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's Monday from next Monday from 2 to 8. 
is the softball cookout. And I'd love for you guys to be there at that. And then junior week, team week, I think pretty much got most of it covered. Do we have any birthdays or anniversaries this morning? Abby. Today, how old is she? Five. She is five today. My goodness. <laughs> My word. Five. Any more birthdays, anniversaries this morning? Behind you. Behind me? First anniversary is Saturday. Titus and Emma, first anniversary on Saturday, right, Emma? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right, all right. Aaron, any more before I... We good, we good. Cool. Aaron, Nathan, Tony, and Will, they're all up there working real hard out in Washington. Uh, you all can keep up with them on Facebook. They post some pictures. I talked to them briefly yesterday. They're having a great time and, and getting a lot of work done up there. It's going to be a huge blessing for Aaron and Savannah when they move out there to Camas uh, here in the next few months. And so we appreciate the prayers and then any support that's gone out to them uh, and the guys in our church. So... That's it. You're good. We got the second song. Thank you. Let's all stand together. She's put up with me for a year now. It'll be Saturday. <laughs> we're going to sing hymn number 340, The Old Rugged Cross, and we're going to do all four verses. Hymn number three. Yeah. <laughs> the Old Rugged Cross, all four verses. On that first. On a hill far away stood an old Yes. 
trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Amen. Good singing. We're going to Turn to hymn number 543, Love Lifted Me. We're going to do all three verses. Hymn number 543, Love Lifted Me. <clears throat> Turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. We'll have the, the guys on tonight. Uh, when the service starts, we were kind of mocking up a, a FaceTime call last, this past Wednesday, just to make sure we could have them on. And, and so we'll have them on just for a little bit tonight so you can see them. They can kind of give a report. Now, they've called every night, just, um, I say excited, but it is, it's exciting, and uh, it's exciting work. Uh, it's it's uh, great to do, put your hands uh, with your talents to, to the Lord's work, and so they have, uh, the the church there at Camas had, had purchased windows, and so the, the windows have been putting in, put, putting in, put in the parsonage, uh, they've cleaned up. Nathan said when he got to the kitchen at the, at the church, he said it was in such disarray. He goes, the first five hours, I just took everything out of the cabinets, made a big pile of stuff that was not useful anymore, and then put everything back in the cabinets. And so I think Tony has actually been doing all the cooking, and, uh, and so they've been calling him Mama Tony, and uh, he's, been, he's been taking care of them, the old guy with the young guys, and, uh, they've, and they've been They've painted the walls in the parsonage. Uh, they, they hope to get the flooring in, uh, and they finished that this morning. They, they got up at 4 this morning. Uh, yeah, at 4 this morning, and uh, Aaron actually called me on accident, and uh, I was like, of all accidental phone calls I get, you know. But uh, they, they, call, uh, they finished up this morning, so they put down new subfloor and new flooring, and they're actually going to put in trim tomorrow. So they didn't expect to get 
they're, they are breaking ground. Uh, uh, they took apart the, the mower on uh, Wednesday morning and uh, put two new belts on it. And uh, a guy showed up and helped them get it running. And so they mowed the property. The grass was two foot tall. So they mowed the property and uh, Nathan trained Save on the weed eater so he can keep the, wheat, the, the church weed eated. And uh, they, they've picked, they've burnt uh, five or six giant piles of stuff. I, I mean, I, you, it became, uh, in, uh, when Aaron and I were uh, there, he said, should I put up all the pictures of the church? I was like, don't do that. And uh, uh, the church became the place, like, if people had stuff that they didn't want to get rid of, uh, that they were, uh, they just took it to the church. So I think I've told you there's seven pianos and two organs there. It's a, it's a small building. It's, it is uh, about the size of uh, our building next door. And so there's a piano on every wall. There are, and I'm, and you can be pro this, anti this. This can be. It's just my, it's my thing. Uh, but there are like 35 crosses. When Nathan called me, he goes, there's a cross on every wall in the whole building. And I said, I know, Aaron told me. He's like, don't pay attention to the crosses. They are everywhere. And they are literally everywhere. And then there's, uh, they've got, a, it's, it's set up. It, it was a, uh, some of you, you'd have to look at church history. But there was a, there was a they made a plan for churches when they were building them. Uh, and, and it resembled ours some, but they had a fellowship area, and they put uh, classrooms all the way around it. So there were probably nine classrooms, but seven of the classrooms are full of floor to ceiling, wall to wall, with just cabinets. And Aaron was like, there must be 35 five-drawer file cabinets here. He goes, they're everywhere. And I was like, you can scrap all that stuff, man, and make money off of it. And, uh, and so they are... They're getting to see all that past history, uh, stuff that we, uh, some of us, used in everyday life, and uh, they're getting to see all that past history and just get that, get that cleaned up. They'll be back. I think Will's coming back Monday, and uh, or at least that's what he told us. And, and so he's coming back Monday, and then uh, the the rest of the game's coming back Tuesday, and they're coming back to a lot of activity, and uh, we've got a lot going on. Uh, Sam and I will be at the park in the morning at four thirty for. Keith Kaiser's uh, little, uh, Sam was like, what is it like? And I was like, we're going to get up at 4.30. We're going to get the horses ready, brushed, and as pretty as they can be. We're going to get to the park early. We're going to walk around so they don't buck, kick, bite, or go wild uh, for their three-minute blurb on WDRB. And we might get to say something, and Keith Kaiser may talk the whole time. And so we're going to stand there and look as good as we can. And he's like, all right, for three minutes, then we're going to park bring the horse trailer home, park the horses, and go back to bed. And that's what we're going to do. So that's our plan. So we'll be up there in the morning, and then the, the week will just unfold. we got a lot of work to do, get the round pen uh, up there and uh, on, uh, uh, on Caitlin's uh, uh, ball, ball diamond. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're so important. <laughs> But the but there uh, everything's just on phone. Yeah, they got girls softball sectionals coming up this weekend as well. So Wednesday and Wednesday and Friday. So it's a busy week, and that day will be blitzed out. I'm thankful it's not two days. I wish it was two days. And so, but it'll be blitzed out, and then uh, back to church on Sunday, and and away we go. And that's the way it's going to work. So it just just uh, it's it's a it's a busy time for you. I know you guys are quiet this morning. Uh, the fellowship was quiet, the singing was quiet. People are tired. I know the uh, the weather's been beautiful. Amen. And uh, you can just get out and work yourself uh, into uh, into the ground and uh, it's been it has been beautiful. Uh, we got babies coming and projects to do at Caleb's. We got a project to finish here before vacation Bible school and and uh, yeah, so uh, if you have nothing to do, holler, and uh, and I'll ha- and I'll help you out with that. So it's just going to be busy. Praise the Lord. Uh, we we did we were we rode horses all day yesterday at, at a fun show, and when we got home, I was getting out. Uh, I turned to get out of the truck, and I just was like, ugh. And Sam goes, "Are you sore?" And I was like, "I'm not 14, man. <laughs> like you can fall down 10 times, you wouldn't be this sore." And I literally just sat on a horse all day. And so I was like, yes, I'm sore. I don't know if my legs are going to work to get to carry this body into the house. So, yeah. 
sore, whatever that is. I told Troy, I said, I'm trying to stay young and it's not working, and, uh, but whatever. All right, so we are in 1 John chapter 3. We've been studying through 1 John between all of the hiccups of uh, different events going on. But today we're going to, uh, we're going to spin out uh, on one verse. And so we're going to be in chapter 3, but we're going to spend the lion's share of our time in verse number 2. If it just, I'm not a, I'm not a, because we, we were involved, uh, Roger and Twyla and some of us were involved with uh, uh, Tom Craig's and Bill Jackson and, and they would, they were big review guys, but they wanted to have a Bible study for an hour and so they would review, and we would have five minutes of Bible study. And so they would review for, for 50 minutes, and we would never get anywhere. So I like to review, especially if you're not here, but I don't want to spend all my time reviewing. So la- last week we, look, we looked at, uh, we started in chapter number 3, and we looked at those, those first verses. Let's just read verse number 1. It says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. And so we looked at, that was the title of the message, but we looked at what manner, and we looked at the Christian's dignity. So this, the dignity was, was really, if I was going to use a better D word, would be the designation. So we saw, not only do we see the dignity, so we, we see uh, that we are distinguished in what we are. We are the children of God. And so because we are the children of God, there are certain promises that God has given us. We, I don't think we understand, uh, and if we take our eyes off the Lord at all, we get away from understanding what it means to be a child of God. And it, it isn't necessarily, as we're looking on Wednesday night at all of those Bible principles, it isn't necessarily the, the Bible principles, I think, that weight us down. We just forget who Christ is and who God is and the privilege that we have to be the children of God. Amen? We get involved in our everyday lives and we just and and we're detached from it. Now, if we were in, I saw a thing yesterday. If we were in, uh, uh, if we were in a, a third world country that was under a lot of oppression, uh, and there was going to be a church service, we would gather our stuff and covertly sneak to a place to gather with other believers so we could sing songs, maybe quietly on purpose and then set under preaching so we could have fellowship with the body of Christ. In America, we are the the church is fighting against all of the extracurricular activities of this world and demanding people to come to church. It it, our our perspective of the privilege of knowing Christ is far different than those that do not have the privilege of doing this. Not just the privilege of of padded pews and an air-conditioned building. Look, we have comforted this thing up so we can can help draw people. If it was just a tabernacle, it was open air, and it was wooden benches, I mean, the the attendance would even be far, far less, and people, many people would show up just for this nostalgia of it. But if it rains, you know, I think of the last probably 50 Sundays, We've had, had here in, in this area, 45 of them, it has started to rain at 9.30. And I just be like, it must be an onslaught from, it is an onslaught from the devil, or Jesus just saying, let's see who will actually show up when it's raining. Can you imagine if you had to sneak in and there were military people looking, looking out for you, and so if they found you, they could execute you? Uh, what, would be, what would be your desire then, I say, to come and be a part of the fellowship of God. We, we, what we want to do here in 1 John chapter 3 is we want to see the privilege of being a child of God and what that is. And you guys know I'm not the love, love, love guy. I'm a command man. I would much rather give orders uh, and follow orders and give lists and do check and check off lists. That's, that is not who I am. But as we're studying this, I want us to to, to mesh our hearts into the next few, uh, next few verses. And uh, I want us to grow from this. I want this portion of Scripture uh, to change us or reset us or, or rededicate us. I want us to look at ourselves in the light of Christ and see the privilege it is to know Him and to be a part of the family of God. That, that of all of the people on the earth, we have had the privilege to hear the gospel of the truth. Not just a gospel, 
Not just a good news, but the good news. And that we have had the privilege to call upon our Creator so that we can have eternal life. So, so I started out with just a monologue this morning. I believe that we are in the last chapters of the book of earth uh, and the book of this creation. We are soon to see splendid changes and remarkable sights for the born again. Uh, I, I, am, I am not as an escapist, but I, am, I, I would love for the Lord to call us home today. I would love to hear the trumpet noise and just get out of here. Now, part of that would be because we got so much going on and it'd be a lot less decisions to make. Amen? And so uh, all those financial decisions, vacation decisions, you know, all of these decisions we could just escape from. But, but I really long to see His appearing. I loathe the fact that there are many of my family that don't know Christ as their Savior. I know, to, I know for me to be called away will take away one of the avenues for them to hear the gospel. And I know how it all, all of that unfolds. But I believe we're in those last chapters. Just like in the last chapters of a book as you anticipate the ending. Who was the murderer? Who, who, what detective is going to find out? Who killed Mrs. P in the, in the library with what article? Just as you are in the very end of what's taking place, the anticipation should be growing, but we see in the Bible the opposite takes place. People are beginning to what? Relax. There, uh, Jesus says when He comes back, will He find faith in all of the earth? There is, a re- there is a relaxedness to the body of Christ instead of an urgency. So I just wrote, time is winding down. We are seeing the falling away. We are seeing the days of Noah. We are seeing the activities of sin on the rise. We are seeing good being called evil and evil being called good. This is about, for us, is about getting ready, rededicating, dedicating areas of our lives called on by God. The production of the gospel and godly living. The boat is almost finished. If these were the days of Noah, uh, they would have had the exterior finished and they would be putting in the last pieces on the inside. And the animals would start be showing up two by two. The, the, the signs of the time are, are written on the wall that you and I are living in. And if we're spending any time in the Word of God, we are beginning to see these things unfold. As we look to the Middle East, we're beginning to see things unfold in the Middle East. We're beginning to see alliances begin to get together from the north and the south. And, in, and those groups are going to eventually come together and they're going to come against Israel. And we're watching those unfold. We're seeing uh, the disappearance. We, we, we've always wondered in, in prophecy, where is America's role in prophecy? Uh, because we've been a, a financial power. We've been a military power. Beloved, we are in financial ruins as a nation. We are on the cusp of, of the military just being undergirded by all of the the new ideas and new ways of living and things going on. We're giving away. We're about to give the the World Health Organization, the WHO organization, America is going to turn over its privilege. So in the next pandemic, America will not make the call for Americans where we have elected our officials. The world pandemic organization that controls all of the moving parts will say this is how it's going to be and this is what we're going to do and these are how these things are going to take place. We are, we are, we are exchanging uh, liberty for safety. And beloved, the greatest safety is in knowing Jesus Christ and knowing you have a home in heaven so that you can't be threatened with, with all of those things. I mean, what can they do? Can a, can a believer be threatened with their life? I mean, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So if I take my last breath here, if you take my life here, you really just set me free to go on into heaven. And it would be very tragic. But it wouldn't be tragic on the other end where we'll see see this morning where our faith will become sight. Where we'll no longer just believe in something we haven't seen. We've seen the evidence of Christ, but we will stand face to face with our Savior uh, and our Creator and He'll welcome us into His presence. So we see the dignity in what we are, a son of God. But in verse 2, it says, Now we are the sons of God, but now we will see our destiny. So we see in verse 1, we see what we are. In verse 2, we see what we will be. 
Look at it with me in verse number 2. It says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it's not asking a question. It's making a statement. It, you, and I won't say a better rendering because I won't correct the Scriptures. But if you have trouble reading that, it would say, Now we are the sons of God. The subject and the verb are just in, in opposite locations. And so he says, Now are we the sons of God. And, he, and then he says... Uh, uh, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And verse 2, is a, there's a lot of truth in this verse, and we just read over it, but this is where we're going to spin out just for a minute this morning. So in verse 2, we see in what we will be. Verse 2, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. 2 Corinthians 5.1 says, For we know that in our earthly house of this tabernacle, if it were dissolved... We have a building of God and a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. I like the phrase and we will look at it, but it uses the phrase, 2 Corinthians 5, 1. Uh, you've got that up there. See this phrase right here? Uh, it says, uh, for, it says, we know that. That phrase occurs 29 times in the New Testament in, in that structure. We know that. It's good to know some things. Amen. I mean, we, we, went yet, we went yesterday, uh, Scott Jennings went with us and uh, his granddaughter. There's a lot of moving parts. Uh, we've got, we have uh, uh, Savannah. Uh, Savannah is never on time. We have Shelby. Shelby's never on time. Uh, we had Caleb, and Caleb got up yesterday, yesterday morning and come over and mowed here so it would look pretty this morning in the front before we went to Pekin. And so he was getting uh, done with that. Uh, my dad was gone. We were wondering what time he would be back and how that would work. And Scott Jennings asked me on Thursday, he said, hey, do you have a plan yet? And I just text back, no, I have no plan. The plan is I hope the rapture takes place on Friday morning. <laughs> That's the plan. And he said, why? And he's not a believer, so he said, why is that? And I said, because then I won't have to make no plans. <laughs> like, I'll be gone. You can have my horse. My trailer, my truck, and he owes everything. And I was like, you can have it all. I mean, I don't care what you take if we're called out of this place. You can have it all. Some of us won't give it all, but if you're called away from this place, you'll give it all. It'll be gone. And so he said, what's the plan? I said, I don't have no plan. I have Savannah, and Aaron's not here. I have Shelby. Uh, and she's running the horses. I don't know what horses we're taking. I don't know which truck we're taking. I don't know which way we're taking. You think coming to Car Township Baptist Church has a lot of ways? Go to Pekin Saddle Club. It's nowhere in the middle of nowhere, and there's nine ways to get there, and there's only one good way to take a horse trailer. And so uh, they, I said, I don't know what way we're going. I literally am going to pack my little cooler with my sandwiches and my Diet Dr. Peppers and two waters. I'm going to put in some pretzel snacks. And I'm going to put in a lawn chair. And that's what I'm putting in my truck. And when we get there, I'm going to get my lawn chair out. I'm going to set my cooler right beside it. And I'm going to sit down in that chair. And I'm going to watch young people do all of the work. I'm not doing it anymore. I'm getting old. And it's their time to do all of the work while I watch. And, so, and I will manage. And I've been doing that for years. But, but I will manage. It's good to know some things. So we started texting back and forth. And Friday night late, we was like... Here's the plan. So we said, I'll be a, I'm going to pick up ice at 12 o'clock, and I'll be at your house. I mean, I love her. But making plans with Shelby is like hitting yourself in the head with a baseball bat. And so she called. Uh, it's from their driveway to my driveway is like, no more than five minutes if you do the speed limit. So you can do it in three and not hustle about it. And I called it quarter after and I said, Shelby, you okay? I got the ice, but I forgot the cooler. So I had to drive back home to get the cooler. <laughs> I was just like, oh, sweet Jesus. You know, and so they showed up and off we went. I like when God and His Word, like, God doesn't plan like we plan. God says, here's the plan. I'm just telling you, I need, I need that. I, I need the clarity from the plan. Uh, 
I'm not a person that has uh, anxiety and what little bit of anxiety that I've had. God has placed me in a family where nobody's on time. And either I would have lost my mind or He has just sucked it out of, out of me. And I just don't care anymore. And I do care. Don't mistake my slight of reservedness for not caring. Uh, I told Savannah and Aaron one day, I said, we're going. We, we had to be at, uh, in Bloomington uh, to sing. And I said, we're going to Bloomington. And I had to preach. And I was like, and we're going we're gonna to leave at 4 o'clock. If you're not here at 4 o'clock, I'm leaving. And I left at 4 o'clock. And at 10 after, he called me. He goes, did you really leave? And I said, I am done doing this. All right? So he had to preach at Pastor uh, or at Josh Pools just a, a, a couple months ago. Uh, to raise support for the trip to Camas. And so uh, he said, we need to leave at 4 o'clock. And I was like, there is no way on this planet I'm going to be ready by 4 o'clock. There's no way. I am going to create so much anxiety in his life with the last few opportunities that I have. <laughs> and so he called it 5 after 4, and he said, hey, are you coming? I was like, oh, we're getting ready to walk out the door. I think Marcy's making coffee, you know. And he was like, Alan, seriously? And I was like, I'm not preaching. You are, all right? So, and Josh likes to start on time and do everything on, on time. I was like, yeah, welcome to the ministry, friend. And uh, so we lolly, I drove the speed limit all the way over because I didn't want to negate the work of God and the life of Aaron, you know. And then I got here. They didn't have the, the chairs in or nothing anyway, so it didn't matter. It's good to know, it is good to know some things. And what little we know about heaven. Somebody in here, we were talking this week out front, maybe Wednesday night, about what's heaven going to be like. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we half know. I'll be honest with you, if he wrote it all down in the Bible with this mind, I don't think we could unfold it. Because it's eternal, without sin... Uh, we had a dumb conversation. I hate to even say this on the live feed. Will there be bathrooms? Will there be a septic system? Will you eat? Yeah, I, and that's a dumb conversation, but it's like it's one of the little details in this whole thing that you're just like, what's it going to be like? Like he put, there's going to be a new heaven, new earth, and he put Adam in a garden to, uh, and, he, and he was uh, going to eat of the trees uh, uh, of the garden. We know that. We know that. Once a year, we're going to go up to the tree of life, and we're going to eat of the fruit of it, and we're going to drink of the water of life that flows out from the throne. We know that. Well, are we going to have to use the bathroom? Can you overeat? What's the food going to be? Is it going to be manna? I, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know, I know more about hell, to be honest with you, from the scriptures than I do about heaven. Uh, because, because hell touches the, the sin condition of man, and, and I've been burnt, and I've been hurt, uh, and I've suffered the, the temporary loss of sight. If it's outer darkness and you can't see, I bit into a phone cable one time to strip it out. We were on the job, and, I, and a phone call come in, and it knocked my eyesight out for like three hours. And I was just like, seriously, that's how it went out? Not in some cool way, but literally biting a little 12 volt, you know. <laughs> I think when it rings, it's like 56 volts or something. I was like, that's how it all went down. I've been shocked six million times. And uh, just so happens, I got a phone call. It was the exact same time I put the wire in my mouth. Like, how could that be? But I know more about, I know more about hell than I do about heaven. Matter, matter of fact, let's just take a break. Uh, mark your spot and turn back to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You know this portion of Scripture probably. But let me ramble through it. 1 Corinthians, look with me. Chapter 15, look in verse number 35. It's usual, usual for me to just preach and to ramble through the verses. Let's, let's, let's look together. 
Verse 35 says, but, but some man will say, let me make sure I've got a lot of reading, so I want to be in the right place. 15, 35. But some, but some man will say, how are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? So there's a question not only in Corinth, there's this question going on in, in Thessalonica as well. What, what kind of body will we have? Will it be a, is it a spiritual body? Is it a, is it a, a, a physical body? Is it, is it a, some kind of, is it celestial or terrestrial? That's kind of the, the argument, which is that when, when Jesus came back, is that the kind of body we're going to have? Will There are songs about Him having the nail scars in His hands in heaven. Will, they, will those be there uh, in heaven and appear side? Will, will He still carry those marks from being on earth? God is a spirit. The Holy Spirit, we assume, is a spirit. Uh, Jesus is the Word of God, but He became flesh. So, so there's a question. I don't know. I, I know we can say to be absent from bodies, be present with the Lord. But have you ever thought about being present with the Lord? What kind of body will you be in? As we were talking Wednesday night, I said, I guess I'll just be on a puff cloud, uh, singing songs and playing on a harp. Except I'm hoping they give me a guitar because I ain't gonna play on no harp. I'm just saying. And then we will like leap from cloud to cloud, like on Bugs Bunny. You know, and we'd be trying to get from Elmer Fudd and keep from getting shot and all that stuff. I mean, that's the kind of stuff we have painted in our minds about, about what heaven will... Will we have little wings that will let us fly, flutter from one to the next? A lady told me a while back, she said, I can't wait to get heaven and get my wings. I was like, you going as a bird? Because I think I'm going to not have wings. She goes, how are you going to fly around? I was just like, I'm going to move from one place to another. I mean, if we look at the Bible and we look at Jesus, it's just like He's here and then He's there and then He's through the wall and then He's over there. Like nature has no hold on Him. And because of that, there will be the need of a new heaven and a new earth if we can just move around. When we see, and I'm maybe talking over your head, but when we see uh, uh, the squared city come down, the new Jerusalem that, that Christ is going to reign for for a thousand years, will millennial Christians be able to go in and out of that city? And how will they get there? Is there going to be an escalator? God forbid. If you ride any escalator around here, it's always broke down. So will you just be able to move there and be there and move from there and be, be back on earth? How will that last? And if it's for a thousand years, are we going to see people come and die that live in their 70s still, three score and ten, while we live all thousand years while they're here? How will that work? Well, I bet not everybody in here has answers to those questions. So uh, we can raise a lot of questions from the Scripture. So it's important to me to know some things. Here are some things I can know. All right, let's read on. I won't do this on every verse. Verse 36, he says, Thou fool. So he asks what kind of body. He writes, Thou fool. That which thou sowest is not quickened, quickened except it die. Now, so he's going to give some gardening, agricultural type language. So you have a seed of corn, and it's been pulled off of a corn cob. And you have a seed of corn. Uh, it dries out and it's hardened. It really is still alive. So when you plant it in the ground, uh, it has to be planted at like an inch and a quarter. And the ground temperature raises to uh, 78 degrees. That seed dies. When it dies, you've heard these words, but it, the process of germination begins. And so that seed, because it has died, but it had life in it, springs forth a new plant, and then that plant works its way. We just planted uh, 16 cucumber plants along uh, our trellis there by the house. Uh, and in the last two days, so it has to be in the ground a certain amount of time. We were, uh, Roger and I were planting uh, clover seed one year for deer hunting. And a clover, a clover seed can lay in the ground for seven years if it's too shallow or too deep. And, but once it gets to the right uh, depth and the pH is correct and the ground temperature is correct, it dies and then it brings forth uh, a a clover stalk. And so it brings and you get those orange and purple heads in your yards that the bees get on and you don't want to run around and barefoot in the middle of summer. You get stung between your toes. And if you wear Crocs or 
or sandals. Be a man, put on shoes, all right? And so uh, you don't run around in no thong sandals and a bunch of crocs outside getting bees in your, in your shoes. And I know I just heard about half of you, but if there was a fire, you wouldn't be useless, all right? Put on shoes. You're an American man, so put on shoes. Anyway, it springs forth. And when it comes forth, what does it produce? Well, a clover seed produces clover. So he's saying to them there, uh, and we're going to see the, the unfolding of it, but this part is the important part. We are in death planted in the ground. Then we are alive or we are brought forth. The, the miracle of the catching away, what, what we would call as the rapture, is that you would escape the planting in the ground part, but you are still going to release. I'm going to use the word shed, but because of my southern accent, it doesn't always sound like that on the live feed. S-H-E-D, E-A-D. I'm going to get rid of this condemned flesh because what's in me is no longer condemned. There's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. So I, I'm going to get rid of this flesh and my spirit, soul, are going to go to heaven. This flesh cannot stand in the presence of God. If, if God in His holiness... Look, look in, uh, I'll let you look in a minute. 1 John 3.3 3, uh, says, He that hath this hope in them purifieth himself, and it says, because he is pure. So when, if God was to show up here in our presence, like our flesh would just burn right, burn right off of us, because we are still in uh, the fashion of sin. And he is not in that fashion, he is holy. So, uh, that's what's taking place. Verse 37, And that which sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. Now when he says some other grain, you're not going to plant wheat and get corn. Alright? So if you plant corn, you get corn. Uh, as soybean fields begin to come up this year, um, you'll see soybeans grow... Uh, I think about 28 inches now. Uh, they have reduced the height uh, because of the wind. And if they've reduced the height, they have less chance of blowover. They've done that with wheat as well. That's why we see so many gut issues, I believe, because they've messed with the wheat protein. But they've, you will see uh, soybeans starting to come up, and there'll be one stalk of corn. It's not a soybean that I identified as a corn. All right? It literally is a corn that was still in the soybean hopper when they planted it. And the soybean can't help but come forth as corn. The, the, the corn can't help but come forth as corn. That's why when God says in Genesis chapter 1, He made them both male and female. How God made you when you came forward, you can't help but be that. You are genetically that. You are, you are physically that. And that's how God perceives you. You can change your pronoun and, and you, can change, you can change the outward appearance. But if they dip your blood, they're going to find out exactly who we are. Now, and I'm not mean, saying that to be mean in any sense. Hey, our country needs truth injected back into it. And it can be done in love, but it needs truth to be injected back in it. And not foolish politicians just trying to get ahead of the longest or loudest line in order to get reelected. Have some principle. Stand on some truth. That's why the younger generations, the, 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 the millennials and the generation Zers, uh, they're looking for truth, I, I believe. And, that, and when I talk to them, they want to know truth. They just want to know what I heard. They don't want to know uh, what somebody told me. They don't want to be told, uh, uh, just do what I say. And, uh, and do it this way. They want to know. They want a purpose for doing what they're doing. A purpose for believing what they're believing. And we all should thirst for that. So he says, verse 38, But God giveth it a body, as it hath pleased Him, and to every seed His own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of the men, 
another flesh of beast, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. So this wasn't E.T. that made that word popular. It was in the Bible already. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, one glory of the moon, one glory of the stars, for one star different from another star in glory. So also, he's still talking about giving things a body. So also is the resurrection of the dead. Oh, now he's beginning to talk about believers that have gone on before. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Because why? This body is condemned. I mean, when it gets sown into the ground, it does what? If you were to go open a grave, you would literally see uh, if it was preserved enough. Uh, We used to have that song. Uh, The worms crawl in, the worms crawl out, the worms play pinochle on our snout. Some of the young kids are just like, what on earth? It was a different time. That's when Santa Claus used to come up on the roof and go click, click, click down through the chimney. How did that dude fit in that chimney? I have no idea. Crisco, I guess. And right, he went. You don't even know what Crisco is. It's crazy being alive today. You think I'm speaking a foreign language. I'm speaking a language that a lot of people in here understand. But anyway. <laughs> so you open up a grave, you know, uh, maybe a sealed tomb in the ground. You open it up and what's left? The clothes, part of the flesh, maybe some of the internals because of, because of embalming and the, and the bone structure. And especially the teeth. And so those things remain. Why? Because that is what's left behind when the soul leaves that place. It leaves behind the dead or the corruption. And that soul either spends eternity now in the presence of God, or eternity now, we, would call, we call it hell, we would. We, the Bible calls it hell, but away from the presence of God is what hell is. We can paint it any way we want it. Hell truly is the absence of God. And so, which unfolds a whole uh, gamut of problems. And so, uh, that soul is planted, and then those souls go one of two ways. So he says, uh, verse 41, There is one glory of the sun, glory of the moon, glory of the stars, one different from another, star of glory, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It's sown in corruption, it's raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. The the last Adam being Christ. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual but that which is natural. So, Adam in the garden came first. Adam and Jesus came second. And afterwards, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is of the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. Who is he talking about? Well, he's talking about us. Those that are earthy. Now he's talking to the church at Corinth, so we're, we are under the assumption he's, he's writing to a body of believers. So he's saying those that are of the earth are earthy. Earthly people should act in earthly ways. That's how they are. The church should not expect the earthy to change to make the church a better place. The church should expect the spiritual condition of the church to change to make the church a better place. And as a result of the church being a better place, then they will have an effect on the earthly. We would say that we then would begin to fertilize the earth, earthy surroundings around us. We would begin, if I, and I'm painting a very loose picture, but we would begin to fertilize the homes around 
our circle of influence. If I am the church, this is the body of Christ, the church, a called out assembly, so we are together, ecclesia, so you and I are together, here we are, but in my circle of influence, as I begin to fertilize the people around me with the, with the, the, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, as I begin to fertilize it, I'm making the pH correct uh, in the areas of people's life. I am, I am unsettling the soil of of that seed until it's getting to the right place. And then when it gets to the right place, that seed then will call on the Lord for salvation. It germinates and a new life comes forward. Amen? There's a lot going on, and that's just rambling off my head, but there's a lot going on in this portion of Scripture. And Paul's trying to, he's trying to combat a false teaching. So he says, verse 44, it's sown a natural body, raised a spiritual. There's a natural and there's a spiritual body. As it written, the first man, Adam, was a living soul. Last was a quickening spirit. Howbeit not first was spiritual, but that which was natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man of earth is earthly. The second man of the Lord is heavenly. As is the earthly, such are also that are earthly. And as heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. It's assumed that believers are living a heavenly lifestyle, a heavenly type of lifestyle. You're you're an ambassador sent to a foreign land, so our residence changes. We trust Christ as our Savior. We're no longer of this earth. We're no longer earthy. We are now heavenly creatures because we 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 are eternal. Once you trust Christ, you may still be living here in temporary time, but you now are, are a permanent figure of heaven. So it says, such are they also that are heavenly. Verse 49, and as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. And that's an important verse. It, it, it goes into our, our verse over in 1 John chapter 3. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit uh, the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So you can't take, if we looked over in the book of Galatians, we would, we would see that a corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. And so if we walk in the Spirit and we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh, we enjoy the fruit, not the fruits, but the fruit of the Spirit, the whole gamut. Love, joy, peace, meekness, temperance, long-suffering. Against such there is no law. They that are Christ have crucified the affections and lust thereof. So verse 50 says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit corruption. Behold. And what, what did we talk about? That's, we talked about that word a few weeks ago. Behold. So we, we stop and, and we look. So this is a moment to ponder. Behold. He says, I show you a mystery. We've talked about this in Sunday school. I think there, there are seven mysteries that are in the New Testament. Uh, they are no longer... <laughs> mysteries. Listen, listen the, the popular verse is to say, uh, well, man, that's a, it's a God thing. I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor hath it entered into the heart of man the thing that God hath prepared for them. I know, we can't know. Who knows? The very next verse says, but God hath revealed them to us by a spirit. So there are things that the world doesn't know, but once we're in Christ, the Spirit of God begins to reveal those things to us. As we read the Word, you say, I I read it and I just don't comprehend all of it. Nor do any of us. Amen? And so what do you do? You read it again. And you read it again. And you read it again. It's the only book, I've got, I've got, say I've got a hundred books at the house there that I've read from, from cover to cover. It's very seldom that I go back and get one of those books and bring it down and say, I'm going to read this again. I'm not a second movie watcher. There are just a few movies in my repertoire that I will watch a second time. Most of, most of them have to do with, never mind, never mind. Cowboys shooting at long distances like sniper movies or gladiator type stuff, you know. And so I like that stuff. I sit on the couch in my Crocs and think about being a man. Anyway, (laughs) I never sit on the couch with my Crocs. I always take them off. So he says, behold, stop. 
Everybody's busy this morning. Hey, if you're on your phone playing games this morning, shut it down. All right? Behold, I'm going to show you a mystery. All right? The mysteries of God, they're not to be trifled with. God's going to unveil something to the church. That what? This portion of Scripture, we read at a lot of funerals, but it boggles the mind. It's, we comprehend it, but we're going to comprehend it better. And so he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. God is not, is not under the authority of the laws of nature. A body does not have to be sown in order to be raised in God's world. One of the most interesting verses in the Bible to me is when Jesus is talking about reaping, so picking, harvesting. And the Bible says that Jesus reaps where he sows not. How can that happen? Because he's magical and mystical? Beloved, because he's God. But I can go to Roger and Twyla's and I can be there because Twyla said, come over, I want to talk about the Lord. And she could be coming to church and, and God could be speaking to her heart and we could sit down at the coffee table and Roger could say, I'm going to sit over here and have a cup of coffee with you all too while we, while we talk. And I can be talking directly into Twyla's life and the light bulbs can be coming on and Roger can look right at you and say, hey, I want to get saved too. Although God has been doing the work in Twyla's life and heart, all of a sudden because he is, he is privy to the good news of the gospel as it's being shared, God can do a work in his heart as well. I mean, and it happens like that. And the lights come on. And new life springs forth. And all of a sudden a, a, a new marriage springs forth. And a new direction for a home springs forth. A direction for a home. Before that, it was just in darkness. So he says, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, I think Eddie had a statistic on that one time, what a twinkling is uh, of an eye, but it's fast. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So the dead... Their corruptible body that's in the ground is going to be raised incorruptible. Now, they're not going to put on their old wore out. Somebody asked me a while back. These are the kind of wild questions. What about all of the men that died in World War II that died out in the water and were never reclaimed and the fish have eaten them? And I'm just like, hey, I don't have to have an imagination to know that if God can reach down and He can take a handful of dust, and he can breathe into that, the breath of life, and a man can come forth, he ain't going to have no problem finding you out in the fish. You might be fish dung floating around out in the ocean, but God ain't going to have no problem collecting you up and meeting you with your spirit in heaven. It's going to be part of the wonder, I think, when we get to heaven. You know, where did you die? Whoa, whoa, wow. You know, God is God. What? It's, it's a tired, warped sense this morning, all right? He says, uh, it, The dead shall be raised incorruptible, we shall be changed. Verse 53, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. That's so we can stand in the presence of God. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality... I mean, it's no longer corruptible. It's no longer mortal. Then what will be said? Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. When our, when our King of kings and Lord of lords has the keys of death and hell, and then we have put on incorruption, and we have uh, put on immortality, and he, we stand in His presence, you and I are going to be partakers of the spoils of His victory over death, hell, and the grave. And we're going to stand in God's presence because of Jesus Christ. 
But He is going to share those spoils of victory with us. We are going to bear the image of the heavenly. We're, we're all not going to look like Jesus. I really believe the Bible teaches we're going to be very unique. And I say, I say silly things like that because there is uh, John, Peter, and James on the Mount of Transfigurations. Two figures appear. Moses and Elijah. You know what? They recognized them. They saw them. Jesus comes back. He is a celestial being, but He's still recognizable and He has Thomas touch His hands and His side. Now, I, I do believe what, whatever the greatest uh, you can be, and see, we wonder about that. Am I going to be, how old am I going to be when I get in heaven for all of eternity? Am I going to be a 19 year old? I don't, it's, it's going to be better than that. Well, am I going to have, you probably had acne at 19, still. You're not going to have that. It's going to be better than that. I know, and this is silly stuff, but, but, I, but I think when we try to take an infinite God and shove Him into a finite mind, and, and I'm not excusing that we shouldn't study the Word and we shouldn't grow in knowledge, but when we try to take an infinite God and shove Him into a finite mind, we come up with a lot of non-answers. Somebody asked me, is our animals going to be in heaven? Well, there are animals. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to be the one that causes somebody to spin out, a, spin out of control about coming to church because an animal they love, the pastor said, no, your animal's not going to be in, in heaven. I'm just being honest with you. I don't care if there are animals in heaven. And if God wants to have animals in heaven, then so be it. But once we're in heaven, whether there are animals or not, He's going to be sufficient. And that will be all that matters. Uh, and, we, and I have strong attachments to animals that I have loved here. I have, well, I'm not going to say that. Then death is swallowed up in victory. Let's just finish, finish this. Verse 55, O death, where is thy sting? The, Paul, Paul says if death is swallowed up in victory, then where is the sting of death? There is none for the believer. We've, I've preached funerals for loved ones here over the last five years, and uh, it can bring great heartache to the individuals that are left behind. But if they know Christ, and many of these individuals have, uh, they took their last breath here, and all the ailments that was keeping them from being upright here on this planet, they washed away, and they were in the presence of God. So this corruptible must have put on incorruption, verse 54, and this mortal put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying is written, death swallowed victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. Well, if you trust Christ as your Savior, where are your sins? As far as the east is from the west. We would say they've been placed in the sea of forgetfulness. They're gone, past, present, and future. So the strength of death is sin. When we're drawn away of our own lust and tempted, it bringeth forth sin. And when sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. Death being separation from God. You and I that are born again will never taste of death. Never taste of death. O death, where is thy string? sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is in the law. The law is what gives sin its power. The Bible says sin is the transgression of the law. And so when we break the law, we are under sin. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore... My beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It has eternal weight. It has gold, silver, and precious stone. We're storing up treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt and thieves do not break through and steal. So 29 times, and I'll just give this portion and we'll be done, and, we'll, and I'll actually preach the message next week. So 29 times we see the language... We know that. We know that. 
in, in a sin-cursed world, there are some things that you and I, it's important for us to know. Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and verse 2, I'll just give a couple of them, says, The same came to Jesus by night and said unto Him, Rabbi, we know that. We know that. They saw the life of Christ and they saw, the Bible says when He was 12 he, uh, and He was found uh, uh, in, the, in the synagogue, He was one that, that knew the Scriptures. And we would say smart eloquently, He was the Scriptures. He was the Word of God. He is the Word of God. And so He had a handle on the Word of God. And so Nicodemus comes by night and says, Rabbi, we know that. Thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do the miracles thou doest except God be with him. They, they perceived and saw uh, the work of God and that did what? That rivaled something inside of them. The younger generations, I believe with all my heart, they're not leaving church because of a multitude of things that, we're, that we see today written. I believe they're leaving the church because they're no longer seeing the work of God in the lives of believers. And so it's not real to them because it's not real to you. And to be honest with you, it wasn't real to me. I wouldn't be here either. Uh, this takes time. Uh, we were talking before about the fun show was fun yesterday, but most of those people were drinking and riding horses and uh, living life to their fullest. Most of them are slept in this morning, uh, sleeping off a hangover. Why well, I came home last night at... 8 o'clock, finish up my message, stayed up till 1 o'clock praying about it, and came to church to preach to a bunch of tired people. Amen? I mean, that's, just, that's the long and short of it. That's how that works. So, so if it wasn't real, I, w- I wouldn't do this for an occupation. Uh, there are other occupations uh, that, you, that you could do. That I, I'd much rather just punch a clock at 8 and be off at 4, and then just go do my thing. And, uh, but that's not what God's called us to the body of Christ. That's not what we're called to. Uh, we're called to live a new life as ambassadors for Christ. So Nicodemus says, we know that. In John chapter 9 and verse number 20, uh, there was a blind man. And uh, the, the Pharisees went to the parents. And they were questioning the parents. What happened? And his parents, says, his parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son. And he was born blind. Uh, they did not say, but they did simply said, uh, he was blind, but now he sees. And he came in and could see us. And they wanted to know by whose authority, by what power. I'll be honest with you, I don't think they cared because he could see. But just a little bit farther down, when you read the account, you see the blind man finally give the glory to Christ. They rebuke Him, and Christ kind of comes by and says, I see you. And now the man that was blind could say what? I see you too. And he went on with his life serving God. We see Paul at the church of Rome. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28. This is a popular verse. And we know that. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. We know that. Uh, I don't, I'm just I'm spitballing now, but when I, when I was praying this week about what to preach and what direction to go, was I going to skip this verse and move on to the next section? 1 John has me bound up. I'm just being honest with you. Because you could spin out on every single verse. And, and I'm saying, as a body of Christ, you might say, I don't want to be in 1 John for the next five years. But we could, and from it, we could preach the whole counsel of the Bible. Uh, it's a very short book, five chapters, but, but it's full of truth. It's like every verse is packed with truth. packed with, And the whole Bible is packed with truth. Uh, but a lot of the conversation stuff that are going on in the Bible, we're just reading through, and then there's a nugget and a nugget and a nugget. First John's not like that. The whole thing is just one giant nugget of truth. And so Paul says, all things. We know that. Paul addresses things eaten. We've been talking about that on Wednesday night, looking at the, the conscience and looking at the Spirit out of Romans 14. And in Romans 8 it says, oh, Romans 8. Uh, in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 
They're talking about eating food offers to idols, just like they're talking about in Romans chapter 14. And he says, as concerning, therefore, the eating of things that are offered and sacrificed unto idols. Because there in Corinth, it would have been a port city, and there would have been lots of people coming in and out. There was lots of, uh, uh, of religious groups there uh, in Corinth. And he says, uh, uh, so he's talking about eating things that are sacrificed to idols. We know that. There's an important truth found in that verse. We know that. There, there, truly are, there truly are not idols. There are only distractions from the real King and the real Lord. We make inanimate objects, or even our children, an animate object, our idol. That idol has no supernatural, spiritual uh, redeeming power. We set them as the apple of our eye. If we look over in Proverbs chapter 6, uh, the command will be, uh, when Jesus prays to God, He tells God, keep the disciples as the apple of your eye. In Proverbs chapter 6, at the end of Proverbs, it's a, it tells us to keep the Word of God as the apple of our eye. The apple is what? It's not a red thing. It's the, the pupil, the thing right in the center. Keep the center of your eye focused on the commandments. Jesus tells God, keep the center of your pu pu pupils focused uh, on your children. And so He says there, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. We would talk about God and we'll say, yeah, He's a God that. Well, when we use the article A and and the, when we use the article A, He is a God that, we are, we are passively saying, if I was to tell Grace, uh, she says, well, I want, what about this? What about that? And I say, well... Uh, our God is a God that loves people. What we're saying by using the article A is that there are other gods that maybe don't love people. We should say He is the God that loves people. Because there's no other G, capital G-O-D God beside Him. We give space to those gods through our, the use of our words. But there truly is no other God. There, there cannot be another God idol when there is only one God. When there's only one God, there can't be another God. So that idol... Um... Oh, here we go. My iPad. I bought a new cover this week. This is one of my idols. Uh, I care for it, take care of it. It's got a special place in my backpack. I bought a new pen. Uh, it's a second generation uh, it actually has a cover that makes it look like a pen with a new tip. Uh, it has gestures built into it. I can tap it multiple times and it will do different things on my iPad. On my iPad this week, um, I put... Please help me and don't fall apart. Idle. I put a new Bible tracker. So this is going to track all of my Bible reading. And I can see the percentage. And numbers are important to me. In, in my music app, I put all of Alexander Scorby's, his whole track in here. So I can just turn on, let's say, Isaiah chapter 1. The prophet Isaiah chapter number 1. And so I can listen to my Bible while I look at my Bible. And I can track my progress with my cool new pen and when it gets put into my backpack, I instructed Sam, when we're done today, this has to go in my backpack. This way into its special sleeve. Because it matters to me. If our house catches on fire on the way out, I'm going to grab that backpack. It's got... How many kids do I got? Six and a wife. Seven. Eight and a dog. So it's in the top ten. It's got one of my guns. It has my MacBook Pro, which 
Some days it ranks higher than in the top ten. And it has my iPad. <laughs> See, it's an idol. If God took this and I still had God, I'll have more than I would ever have had with this and God. There's not another God. We'll look next week at what knowing that means. And we'll look at those three phrases found uh, in verse number 2. With the whole purpose, not that you need to flip back because we're done. With the whole purpose of verse number 3, and every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. It is doing what? It's taking sediment away from us. What did, what did, the, what did Proverbs say? Proverbs said that, that the, the, the finer puts the, the gold into the pot so he can do what? He can remove the sediment. It's called dross. The dross will raise to the top and he will take a ladle and he will pull the dross off of the top so he will have pure gold, he says, that is worthy of the finer. Now the finer can make uh, a necklace or an earrings, but he can make an ornament that will be of pure gold because where all the impurities exist is a weak spot for it to break. And you know what we don't need in our lives in this world of distraction? Weak spots where we can break. We need to have this hope in us and know some things so we can purify ourselves because He is pure. And then it goes back to chapter number 2. Then we have fellowship with Him in the light because we are in the light. It's, it is, it's beyond getting saved. Look, salvation is the greatest thing you'll ever do. But then surrendering your life to serve God will open up new areas of who God is in a way that you can't see Him just being a saved member of a church. Uh, and then you can see the hand and the work and the evidence of God. Until what? Until we get rid of this carcass through death or catching away and we stand in the presence of our Creator. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for this morning. We thank You. I thank You, Lord, for Your Word. Thank you for the move of the Spirit this morning in our minds and hearts. Lord, I'm not, I'm not trying to lessen where someone is at this morning, nor compare where someone is at with someone else. But Lord, I know you have the answer for us all. So from the child with, with nightmares to the adult... Uh, that is lonely, I know that you are the answer. And to every answer between. Lord, I pray we would call on you in our time of need. Lord, and then we would search you as fine gold. And Lord, we would find you, see your work in our midst, and you would be praised. And with this finite life, we would bring glory to the name of God and to our Savior, Jesus Christ. We love you. In Christ's name, amen and amen.